Welcome to Beaver Works Summer Institute's 2021 Autonomous Underwater Vehicle Challenge. I am Dr. Madeline Miller, the lead instructor and captain of this expedition. We set sail with a clear purpose, to have fun and learn the fundamentals of autonomous underwater vehicle operations. Along the way, we will make deep dives into autonomous control, image processing, and object-oriented programming with port calls in hydrodynamics, data acquisition, vector math, and linear algebra. We'll dip our toes into the basics of the Linux command line interface, shell scripting, and practical operations. Stuffed to the gills with this knowledge, students will work in pods to train an AUV to navigate a marked waterway using only a camera. During the course, students have a whale of a time working with a single board computer to acquire and interpret imagery to determine how to steer their AUV. While the students develop code at home to interface with the hardware, the teaching staff will reel in some fresh underwater data to ensure they can handle the challenges of a real world mission. Once the students have learned all they ought to know, they will release their code on an AUV to navigate an undersea waterway while following nautical rules. The teams will have a friendly competition and no one will be anemone. All right, I'm bringing up my presentation. Brief introduction, can you see that? Thank you all for joining us. Welcome to the final event for the Autonomous Underwater Vehicle Challenges inaugural uh, expedition. Um, I'm Madeline Miller, and I would like to welcome everyone who is uh, joining us over the live web stream on behalf of uh, myself and all of the my co-lead, Joe Edwards, and the rest of the instructional staff. Um, you probably know at this point because you have been watching your uh, kids along the way, the goal of the 2021 AUV challenge was to develop a uh, custom autonomy payload, um, also known as a backseat for an autonomous underwater vehicle um, that would then, by the end of the course, be able to navigate a waterway um, with lighted underwater lighted buoys um, without any in intervention, so fully autonomous. Uh, the vehicle that we chose for this course uh, is a bluefin sand shark, which is pictured on the right hand side. Um, and you can see the, the payload section is a, the custom part that we were replacing for the purposes of this course. This is uh, the, to introduce us a little better, um, this course is led by myself and uh, my colleague, Joe Edwards. Uh, we are both uh, technical staff at MIT Lincoln, Lincoln Laboratory, um, where our day job is to develop research and develop technical solutions for the challenges that the ocean presents to the DOD operations. Um, we were joined on our, <laughs> we were joined on our expedition by uh, four very intrepid uh, teaching assistants um, who may have overlooked the fact that we had never done this before. Um, these are, they're all here today. I want to introduce Ashley Kamal, Joseph Ntaimo, Vera Staub, and Nandini Thakar. Um, we also had a great deal of help along the way from uh, guest lecturers and volunteers, and some of whom uh, served both purposes uh, during the course. Um, also, as people are most likely already aware, um, we have an excellent team of students who participated in this course and uh, really the key to our success. Um, all of these students were selected uh, by because of the work that they completed uh, during the spring course material prerequisites. We definitely could not have done this without them. Uh, we ended up with a somewhat bi-coastal uh, class distribution, class and instructional staff distribution. As you can see on the map, um, we have a number of people in California, and then most of the rest of people are on, on the East Coast, um, with the one exception of Tennessee. This, of course, led to some management of time zones. Um, so as we were uh, developing the skills to be able to accomplish the final challenge, um, we presented the students with a number of uh, challenge problems and uh, lab, lab exercises um, for the first few weeks of July. Um, and we're going to show a few examples. Uh, so for the autonomy logic problems, um, we had a simulation that the students actually themselves helped to develop, um, <laughs> the simulation itself, um, and then had to learn how to uh, use Python commands um, that were similar to the commands they would face in the real challenge uh, to steer through some virtual buoy courses in preparation for steering through the final underwater course. Um, 
for the uh, image processing and uh, image processing expertise development uh, component. Um, we had some interesting challenges. A few of you may remember, or all of you may remember, the viral sensation of the dress a few years ago, uh, which uh, led to great debate over what is the actual color of the dress. Um, I know we don't have input, but at this point, this is the point at which I would like to ask the audience what color they think this dress in this picture is. Um, and since you're not going to be able to respond to me, I will tell you uh, at this point that some people see this dress as white and gold and some people see it as blue and black. <laughs> and there is only one correct answer. Um, and about half of our class saw it as white and gold, the other half saw it as blue and black. A couple people were able to, uh, to straddle those two different uh, color themes. Um, but we then gave them the challenge of actually determining using Python code uh, what is the true color of the dress and uh, use it to and and then replace those colors with uh, other colors of their choosing. You can see some of the results of that exercise uh, on this slide from the different student contributions. Other exciting challenges in image processing um, uh, was to determine to be able to decode as a team um, a secret message that we sent the students um, in noisy images. Uh, and this enabled the students to learn more about detection and filtering and, uh, and also teamwork. And unfortunately, I didn't get any screen captures of it, but they did. Uh, they each had separate sections of the code, and then they worked together on a Jamboard. Um, the final result you can see here to, uh, to decipher the message that we sent them on a Friday afternoon. As we rounded the corner, so to speak, uh, to the final event, we were hard at work uh, actually developing the hardware uh, for uh, the, the uh, final payload uh, that would carry the student's code. Um, and this is an image of the payload that uh, went on to replace the uh, standard payload of the Bluefin Sand Shark. Uh, you can see on the right we had, uh, and you'll see also in the student presentations, we did have some uh, interferences with the wall. Um, uh, there one particular team uh, took home the award for the most number of wall interferences um, for, and the instructors helped with one of them. We had three serious incidents. Uh, some more, uh, so this is us uh, getting, to, getting to the end of the course, um, doing the hardware integration uh, ballasting. You can see this is an introduction to what the, the final course looked like. We were in the MIT uh, Z Center pool, Zessiger Center pool. Uh, we were given a 35 meter by 25 yard section of pool to work with. Um, and you can see one of our TAs, Joseph Ntaima, setting up um, buoys that he actually developed um, and built at the edge of the pool, the green and red buoys, getting ready to set out the obstacle course. Um, it, the, the one thing the vehicle did need help with <laughs> was to be held in place at the very beginning of its missions. Um, so Joe and I took turns uh, doing the physical launching and the code launching from the surface. And this is an underwater view of the beginning of the challenge course from the perspective of the vehicle. Um, and you can see that to nobody's surprise, uh, red is absorbed uh, much more quickly than green underwater, so it's quite difficult to see um, any of the red buoys uh, beyond that first gate. Um, so the final teams uh, worked together uh, for about two weeks in the course. Um, we worked to make sure that there was a mix of members of different strengths in the student teams, um, and you will see from their presentations uh, that, well, whether or not we succeeded, uh, they succeeded in uh, accomplishing everything that we hoped they would. Um, and we are going to now turn it over to the groups to give their own presentations uh, in the order that is listed here and that has also been posted to the students on Discord. Print, oops, you are up. All right, hello everyone. So we are the group Print Oops, I'm Brandon. I'm Ishi. I'm Garima. And I'm Robert. And today we're going to be talking about our process in programming an AUV or autonomous underwater vehicle. So first, in our challenge, we remotely tested our code on a sand shark, which is a type of AUV. Overall, AUVs are incredibly useful because they're perfect for marine missions where humans can be at severe risk. 
For instance, they can collect ocean data, including info about marine life and minerals. So AUVs normally operate in oceans, but since we unfortunately can't test our AUV in the rough, rocky ocean environment without losing them, we operated in MIT's pool with some custom red and green buoys to navigate through. So our mission slash goal was to successfully navigate through four pairs of gates within the pool. To complete this goal, we first needed to be able to detect both green and red buoys with image processing. One way to separate and identify objects in an image is to use decision rules with threshold values. To do this, we split the image we were given on the left into its BGR channels, which you can see in the middle. And from each channel, we could figure out pixel values that would allow us to distinct objects from its background. Using these BGR values in a decision rule lets us find areas of the image that were red and green. However, simply finding the centers of the red and green areas in the image were not producing completely accurate results for us, which is why we decided to take our object detection to the next level. First, we applied box filters, which smooths the image by averaging neighboring pixels, as you can see in the middle. Next, we found the contours of both red and green on our image. This would give us all the different regions of the image where red and green were detected. To get rid of any outliers, we looked at the size of the contours to determine which ones were actually the buoys. You can see the resulting contours for both the green and red buoys in yellow in the right images. Once we detected the buoys, we needed to find the angle to the object. To do this, we used the focal length of the camera, which we have labeled as F in the diagram, and the distance between the image center and the image point, which we call R. Taking the inverse tangent of the horizontal distance F divided by the vertical distance R gives us the angle to the object. With the angles we found using the formula in the previous slide, we saw our desired heading to be between the two buoys by averaging the two angle values. Using the difference between the desired heading and the heading that the AUV was currently at, we adjusted the rudder by sending a command with the amount it needs to turn. When multiple buoys were seen simultaneously, we used the size of the buoy to determine which one to move towards. And when no buoys were seen, we let the AUV continue in whichever direction it was going in until another buoy was detected. So once we actually had the desired heading, we had to figure out which way to turn, either left or right. So one way is usually going to be shorter and therefore more efficient. In order to find the proper direction, we calculated the current heading minus the target heading. We can usually find the direction based on whether this difference is positive or negative. However, if the magnitude of the difference is greater than 180, which is half a circle, then we know that turning the other way is much shorter. So one issue that we had to account for was if we entered the gate at a steep angle, which often made us not um, able to see another gate as shown in this diagram. So to account for this issue, we track the angles to the red and green buoys. Once we pass the gate, we check if the angle to one buoy was much larger than the angle to the other. If so, this means we entered at a steep angle. To then adjust our course, we see if the green buoy angle was much larger than the red buoy angle. If this is the case, this means we are too close to the red buoy and therefore need to make a sharp left towards the green buoy. And if the opposite is true, then we simply turn the other way. Now that we have the logic for our actual AUV controller, it was time to put it all into practice in an actual code. The general structure of the program is split into three sections with a few more attached to the back seat. First of all, the front seat, which is the code that we didn't write, that controls the actual motors on the uh, bluefin sand shark, such as the rotor and the rotor to move forward. This front seat periodically sent us navigation data to the back seat in the form of a command. The back seat then read this data and as well as read data from the camera to send it to the AUV controller. Our AUV controller then decided what it needed to do based off this navigation and camera data. This data was then sent back to the back seat where it formatted what it needed to be done and sent this to the front seat. And the cycle repeated for 60 seconds at which point the code was shut off. While programming this, we ran into several issues that we had to fix on the fly. First of all, we ran into an issue with hue saturation value color scheme versus blue green red color scheme. Originally, we were using HSV to find what the buoys looked like. However, we ran into issues when converting from the original image to an HSV 
and this took us a while to figure out, but eventually we just switched to using BGR. Additionally, some of the messages called BPRMB between the back seat and the front seat were being dropped. And it was fun to debug, as you can see by this text. This is what we basically got to see while this was running. And this was eventually figured out that the front seat simulation wasn't running as fast as the back seat, and it was dropping some messages. And here's what our code actually looks like when it was running in the water. So as you can see uh, through that short video, we went through the first gate, but we started veering right after that. That is most likely an issue with our AUV controller algorithm, but considering we only had one day of testing, I'd say it's pretty good, especially since we didn't crash. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Robert, would you like to tell the audience why you didn't crash? Uh, we didn't crash because we actually set a stop command and didn't go extremely fast. Oh, I thought Joseph jumped on your vehicle once. Oh, that was the second time, I think. <laughs> the first time, luckily, it did. I don't really know why it happened like that the second time, but oh well. The second time we um, we tried to improve our logic by, I think, moving faster and changing the angles that it would turn, but then that didn't work out because with the hydrodynamics and everything. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, we do have several questions. Um, one question is, why uh, green and red buoys were used in the um, in navigating the path? I'm going to jump in and answer that one um, since that was more of a course design thing. So the red and green uh, buoys comes from the U.S. Coast Guard uh, buoys the surface the from the markings that the U.S. Coast Guard use for um, waterways for surface vessels. It's uh, obviously not optimal for underwater vessels, and it's generally not used for underwater vessels it's because of the red absorption problem. Another question for this group is, what was your proudest or most exciting moment in the process of working with the AUVs? Oh boy, I would say for me personally, it was when it actually ran. <laughs> We we went for at least like four to five days without any of the code working together, and when it run, we were all so happy because it took us. That was a that was a good that was a frustrating process. Yeah, I agree, and I think especially when the problem with HSV versus BGR, like that was causing us so many problems. So when we finally figured that out, that we needed to not convert the color scheme, we it just made us so happy when we figured that out. Yeah, for me, I really liked when we first tested it in the pool and like in the video that Robert showed, it actually was able to go through, I guess, one and a half gates. And that was um, that was really fun to watch. So, Yeah, like Brandon said, like the first day of testing in the pool was pretty exciting because like some groups went before us and they like their code wasn't even able to start moving or anything. So we were expecting a bad run for the first try, but ours went through like one gate and then nearly missed the second gate. So we were pretty happy with our first run. That sounds wonderful to have that um, have that work out so well. The next group is, I believe, um, West Coast, Best Coast. When designing autonomous systems, we should be able to relate to it the most as we ourselves, human bodies, are very efficient and successful autonomous systems. Naturally, as we would with tasks for human body in real life, we always start with observations. And to make observations, we need sensors to be able to collect data from around us. For example, human eyes are essentially camera sensors. We are continuously getting images from our surroundings, which we then later use to process and analyze to draw conclusions regarding the size, color, and shape of an object. This is basically what we did when we were trying to work with sensors with our AUV. We had to access to a or we had access to a Raspberry Pi camera, which we used to collect periodic images of what buoys lay in front of the AUV so that we can successfully pass through the gates. Uh, once we have the data we need to analyze, the next step is to actually analyze it. 
This is similar to how our brain analyzes observations that our other senses might collect. Bringing this connection to a more relevant situation, the optic nerves in our eyes transmit these images from our eyes to the brain. The brain then processes these images by actually determining uh, the shape, color, or size of any and all objects in the system. Similarly, the Pi camera takes the images and then another buoy detection module uh, in our code acted like the brain in the situation and analyzed the images and returned the horizontal angles to uh, the buoys and also the colors of the buoys along with that. The next step would be with making a decision based on what we see. Depending on the objects that we see, our brain might require us to react differently. If we are driving a car and see a red light, the decision we make in our brain would be to stop the car or more specifically put your foot on the brake and press down. Similarly, the code would analyze the images and decide how to position the rudder to make the AUV travel in a certain direction. After receiving information from the autonomy logic, the vehicle would do actual actions and perform actual tasks like rotating the rudder or increasing the engine speed. This is like when you think you want to raise your hand, then you actually do it. Splendid. Sometimes it doesn't always work the way you want it to, uh, but in the end, your vehicle would listen to your brain and carry out functions uh, as specified by the brain. This is like our vehicle control in the AUV, uh, which would take in bluefin messages from the autonomy logic functions and then change uh, the rudder angles or engine speeds uh, uh, to actually control the hardware. These are like our legs that actually do the walking function that the brain wants us to do. So here we have a hypothetical setup of the AUV. This is the AUV, and these are two buoys, the red one and the green one. And so right now our image processor would have matched the red buoy and the green buoy. And what the AUV would try to do is turn towards this gate to pass through it but we want to pass through it specifically perpendicular. So along this line. So after it passes through, it'd be heading straight this way. And the reason for that is because the uh, AUV only has a set HFOV, which is horizontal field of vision, uh, field of view. And so if we pass through at too sharp of an angle, say along this line over here, where uh, my pointer is going, then it would only be able to see from maybe here to here, and so if any buoys were over here, then we would have no chance of seeing them. If we pass through perpendicular, then we would see both on top and on bottom to the next buoy. And so the first step it does in take calculating the, uh, the turns it has to make is drawing a line from the furthest buoy, which in this case is the red one, to its current position and taking the midpoint. And so now we have a point, we have a point here and a point where the AUV is currently at. And we have a tangential line, which is the current heading of the AUV. And using those three parameters, we can calculate a circle. And from that circle, we can calculate radius and using the turn turning rate of the AUV, which is given experimentally, we can calculate what we have to set the rudder to in order to turn along this circle. And so, Right now, it would give a command to set that rudder and then begin turning along the circle. The next step, after a set point of time, it would run another set of code, which this time it sees that it does intersect. Uh, the current heading does intersect with the perpendicular line. And so it would draw another circle. And this time it would draw a circle with these two being tangents and this point or the current point of the AUV being a point that the circle has to pass through. And so now we have this new circle. And so the AUV would go in a straight line to towards this point on the circle. And then once it reaches this point, then um, it would start turning. So it would set another rudder. This would give us a uh, relatively like S-shaped path that our AUV will take in order to go through the gates perpendicular. Let's try Brandon's logic in this simulation.
As you can see, with our successful run, we were able to cl clear 50 gates with Brandon's logic in addition to conserving a lot of battery. One of the most important parts of autonomously controlling your AUV is communication between your programs. All of the, your programs require require each other's information in order to um, do their function. One example is in order to detect a buoy in the buoy detect function, the, um, the function needs an image from image processing in order to do its job. Another other example is the decide function needs the conditions of a boot detect function in order to make a decision on where to go. Next, we is logging. In order to communicate with um, the other files, import, it's important to store the information somewhere so the other files can know um, where they can read the information from. And with with those, we were able to to uh, test this in real life. As you can see, our our testing was 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 all right. We we were able to move our AUV in a straight line, and we we passed the first case by turning autonomously. It was great. Um, fortunately, um, after reviewing what we um, our files and our logging, we we realized our image processing didn't was was exporting bad images, which resulted in us not being able to pass the most most of the gate at the end, and in addition to that, um, our program was was kind of difficult to, to debug because it was sending one error while it was um, it was probably syntax error from somewhere else. Uh, thank you f to everyone who, who made this possible, especially our teachers at Joe and Madeline and our TAs. And we we hope to continue learning about this in field in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. And we do have some questions. Um, the first question is, what aspect of this course did you find the most challenging? I can answer that. So there is this one part while we were trying to get the front seat and the back seat to talk where we couldn't somehow uh, kind of pinpoint what the actual error was. I think there was some kind of non-type error with one of the variables. So um, it took us about a day or so to fix that, although it's a pretty simple problem because we don't exactly know where the problem is. Uh, the code actually just returns like a socket error if there's something wrong with it. So we have to uh, kind of use some coding to figure out where it actually is and just, yeah. But that was pretty challenging. But when we did kind of uh, get past that point, it was it, we got a bit excited. And another question is, um, what made you interested in AUVs? I, 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 can, I can take that one. Um, I think the one really made you interested in AUVs is like the challenge of like, like being fully autonomous. Like it's really hard to um, control something from like a boat to a to a submarine down below because like um, the, the water like basically cancels out a lot of the signal. So we have to control things autonomously and like um, it's like quite a challenge to like um, develop the code to, um, to you know, not break the robot and, and make, uh, in addition to like getting, uh, retrieving the data. Thank you. Okay, our next group is um, the Radiant Rainbow Squids. Hello everybody. Our team is the Radiant Rainbow Squids from the Underwater Autonomous Vehicle Challenge and we thank you for taking the time to come to our presentation. My name is Nitin. My name is Ashita. My name is Carmen. My name is Rima. And my name is Aid. 
So for this challenge, our team separated uh, it into four main parts, vehicle control and dynamics, image processing and object detection, software integration and autonomy logic, and last but most certainly not least, mission reconstruction and logging. So starting us off will be Nitin talking about what this challenge actually entails. So this challenge consists of writing code to be uploaded to the Sandshark, a picture, a picture of which is seen on the slide which will allow the AUV to navigate autonomously through a course of red and green buoys. A green and red buoy next to each other constitutes a gate in which the AUV needs to pass through. With many gates throughout the pool, the challenge is to code the AUV to be able to pass through all the gates efficiently. It sounds simple enough, but that certainly wasn't the case. We encountered many challenges along the way. So with that in mind, let's move on to the first part of our presentation, which will be presented by Ashida, Carmen, and Rima. The first integral part of this project that we will talk about is vehicle control and dynamics, which works with predicting how the AUV will move and deciding what adjustments need to be made to make the AUV move as anticipated. Here you can see the task flow for vehicle control and dynamics. Starting at the very top left, we search for the buoys that are in the water with the goal to pass through a buoy pair. Once the buoys are detected, calculate the angle needed to travel between buoys and then determine the rotations per minute or RPM needed to take the AUV to the desired heading. Next, we update the state of the AUV, which updates the position and heading of the sand shark and prints it out to our terminal to for us to monitor. Ideally, the Raspberry Pi camera uses frames to detect where the red and green buoys are in the image and calculate the midpoint of the two buoys and returns what the horizontal angle to the midpoint is. In the case that it only detects one buoy, it will start searching for the matching buoy. One thing that we had to take into account was that when changing the rudder, we must do so in the opposite direction of the desired heading. Let's now talk about the challenges that we faced with vehicle control and dynamics. The first one is that even after recognizing the buoy pairs, the logic may not change the heading. It can also enter the gates at an angle that prevents the AUV from viewing the next gate. There is a need for the code to use a seeking behavior, meaning it will need to actively look for the gates rather than just going straight or aborting the mission when it can't find anything. An integral part of vehicle control and dynamics is being able to use the camera to detect the buoys. This is where image processing and object detection come into play. Let's talk about that next. To present this part of the project, we have Rima Zaid in it. Okay, so this photo here shows uh, the buoys that we use to navigate through our challenge. They were made by our wonderful uh, teaching assistant, Joseph, who used Tupperware, battery packs, microcontrollers, LED strips, and uh, a few other things to make these very simplistic yet very versatile buoys. And uh, these buoys were then tied to weights underwater. And actually, if uh, we switch to the next image here, you can see them in action as the AUV is attempting to go through them. Now for an overview of the whole image processing and object detection logic. The code will load the image of the, that the AUV takes of the buoys farther away, resize the image, and then a blurring filter is applied to the image to make it easier for the code to detect changes in color. Then using the image with all of the changes, the code detects the pickle, pixels in which the red and green buoys are located and then sections them out. Finally, trigonometry is used to find the angles to the buoys, and this information is sent to the vehicle control and dynamics code, which then calculates the heading and RPM required to pass through the gates. Um, the next slide shows you some of the sample tests that we did to check our code. The image on the left shows the test frame that was provided to us. The white circles show our buoys that we needed to be recognized by the code for a successful logic. The image on the right shows you the same image on the left, but with the red and green dot on where the code recognized the red and green boys. The code successfully found the boys and placed the dots on them. Obviously, this code will not work all the time, and we had many false detections. So let's talk about that next. One of the main challenges with image detection is false detection. Sometimes with the way the camera processes the image, the code assigns the color dots to the opposite buoys or even to points on the floor, which messes up our calculation of the angle. Reflections also cause false detections. The pictures on the slide show many false detections the code had. Let's now talk about one of the most essential parts of the code, software integration and autonomy logic, which will be presented by Carmen and Zaid. Okay, 
So one of the most important parts of uh, this project is deciding first off what commands to make and making sure that whatever commands we decide to give our AUV are in a format that the AUV can actually process and understand. So data from a sensor called the inertial measurement unit is processed by the front seat. And the Raspberry Pi camera sends a frame and conducts image processing to detect buoys and return their relative headings from the AUV's current heading. This information is then processed by the AUV controller, which handles figuring out what speed and rudder need to be set for the vehicle to get through the gate. This information is then compiled back into a command called an NMEA command, which the front seat is then able to process into the rudder actually turning and your motor actually running. Last but not least, we will discuss mission reconstruction and logging. The purpose of this was to keep track of what occurred in our missions. With this, we could better understand the actions of our AUV and make improvements for future missions. Like Grima mentioned, our main objective was to keep track of what happened in our missions. One way we did this was through plots. In the image on the right, you can see a plot of our mission. The blue line is the actual path our AUV took whereas the green lines are the paths it would have followed at its reported heading had we not turned it. This plot is from one of our simulated missions and around 17 on the x-axis, you can see the AUV had to make a sharp turn to pass through a gate, resulting in a large change in heading. Next, we have Rima with an example plot of one of our runs. Now we're gonna take a look at a clip from one of our missions. As you can see, our AUV crashed into a wall on that mission, hence why the file is appropriately named bonk.mp4. This is one of the examples of how a mission can go terribly wrong and why we need mission reconstruction so we can figure out what happened. And this is what actually happened on the challenge day. So if we play the video here, uh, we can see that the AUV looks like it's heading for the gates, but then goes right around the side of the gates and then beelines directly for the middle of the next two gates. And if we just wait here for a second, it then immediately goes around the other side of the next gate before uh, virtually going through the last and final gate. So you can see the plot of uh, this mission over on uh, the, I believe that would be your right hand side if you're looking at this. And uh, what happened here is we had a small mistake in our code where um, uh, the AUV was trying to go around the buoys instead of through the buoys. So uh, unless the heading was in between the buoys. So at least in that case, it was technically successful. This project would not have been possible without the help of many people. We would like to thank and acknowledge the amazing TAs, Ashley, Joseph, Nandini, and Vera, and of course, Captain Joe and Madeline. A big thank you also to my fellow team members, and thank you for listening to our presentation. So before we have to squidaddle, um, does anyone have any questions? Thank you so much for your presentation. That was so fascinating to hear about um, your various missions, and especially bonk.mp4. Um, so one question is, how would you integrate other sensors such as sonar? If we did have access to um, sonar, then we would be able to create um, possibly a more complex um, searching algorithm for the buoys, because we would also need to have, we currently just use the horizontal angles relative to the AUV's heading just to look for them. But with sonar, we would have um, spatial data, so to speak. So we would be able to um, determine the distance well, we can do that with um, camera data, but it's not necessarily um, accurate due to um, water physics. But if the acoustic signature of the buoys gave off a certain um, unique, uh, uh, sorry, but like if the acoustic signature of the buoys was unique enough such that um, we could use sonar to detect them without um, dealing with interference from, say, any swimmers in the pool or signal bouncing off of the wall and back to the, um, the AUV, it would definitely be possible. Next, uh, we have the question whether there is a hidden meaning behind the subtitles of the slides indicating the various sections of your presentation. 
I can take that one. Um, no, no, there is not. They are just uh, very fun um, puns related to each kind of section. And just in case anyone was wondering, the binary beneath software integration and autonomy logic just said hi. So uh, there, there's no real secret plot, no conspiracy theory. It's just, it, it was very fun. Great. Well, thanks again for your presentation. Uh, and our next group is the Sinkers. Hello, we're the Sinkers. Our presentation for the AUV challenge. Meet the team. I'm Aiden Carrier. I'm Bria Remley. I'm Bobby. I'm Matthew. And I'm Naomi Naranjo. And together we are the sinkers. sinkers. That was not synced up. <laughs> Okay, so AV challenge. Uh, before you, AV, as you were told, AV stands for Autonomous Underwater Vehicle, and we use the Bluefin Sand Shark, which you see below. And we need to navigate through a series of buoys using image detection to process images taken from a Raspberry Pi camera in order to create autonomous decisions. The final challenge took place in the MIT pool with the help of TA Joseph and Captains Madeline and Joe. So to divide up the work that we had to get done, we created three main groups. We had our image processing group, we had our autonomy logic group, and we had our mission reconstruction group. The goal of image processing was to detect the green and red buoys as the AUV navigated through the pool. We did this by taking pictures on a Raspberry Pi camera that was mounted at the top at the front of the AUV. After receiving these pictures, we isolated them into their separate R, G, and B channels, which you can see at the top right. Using these three images we were able to generate, we created upper and lower thresholds to isolate the buoys from the rest of the image. We created an object detection surface, which is an array of booleans of values that satisfied the thresholds, after using a box filter to smooth out the noise in the image. Afterwards, we found the contours of the buoys in the image. A contour is essentially the blob of true Boolean values in the object detection surface that represent what the camera code detected as the buoys. We then used another box filter to increase the size of these contours, producing the result shown in the bottom right. By averaging the X and Y values of the contours, we were able to calculate the centers. From them, we calculated the angles of the buoys from the sensor using trigonometric formulas based on the diagram in the bottom left corner. This is an example of the final product for image detection. The two images you see here are two actual frames taken by the Raspberry Pi camera during our test runs. In these images, our image detection algorithm was able to detect the green and red buoys and mark them with a blue and red dot respectively. All right, um, the next two subgroups are software integration and autonomy. autonomy. Um, to preface the description of the two uh, modules, we should probably first discuss um, the anatomy of the stand shark itself. So um, it, simply put, consists of a front and a back seat. Uh, the front seat acts somewhat as a server sending, uh, sorry, communicating directly uh, with the um, sand shark's mechanics, while the back seat takes the form of a client. Um, the back seat uh, uses information um, from the front seat to generate commands that are sent back to the to generate commands that are then sent back to the front seat and resultantly um, the underwater vehicle. Okay, so um, the first of the two subgroups, software integration, um, acts as the bridge between the front and back seats, uh, sending and parsing messages. Uh, the messages are sent back and forth in the form of BFNVG and B, B, BPRMV um, messages. The BFNVG uh, message conveys vehicle state information such as position, speed, and heading. Um, and the B BPRMB uh, request passes vehicle adjustment information, such as the amount of change in the rudder desired. Um, in addition to the communication, the software integration subgroup worked to resolve all bugs and errors in the code. Um, the second of the two subgroups um, is called autonomy logic. In short, it consists of a function that returns a vehicle command based on the vehicle's current state or its heading and the relative angles to the green and red buoys that the um, image processing subgroup detects. Um, in most cases, the autonomy logic will simply return the um, average or the mean um, angle between the two buoys. 
but of course there are special cases when this is uh, when this does not happen. I guess one a couple examples of special cases would be when more than two buoys are detected, where then it would um, uh, return the angle between the the pair of buoys whose difference in angle is the largest because um, as you get closer to the buoys the angle uh, your angles to them will be uh, the, the absolute value of the angle to them will be larger and the um i guess another uh situation when another exception would be when there's only one buoy detected and the um and the uh, autonomy logic would try to steer like in the correct direction based on the color of that buoy. So this is a little demo of our autonomy logic passing through simulation um, successfully. The main goal of our mission reconstruction group was to collect some data while the AUV was conducting its mission and record the data in a file so we could look at it after the runs and use the data to better our code so we could pass through more buoys. We used the CSV module to write functions that allowed us to create CSV files and store the data in them. Using the Python library pandas, we were able to read these files that had been saved, which allowed us to plot and create an animation based off of the position data that we had position data that we had recorded. This video shows a an example of this animation where the AUV is just going in a straight line. All right. Um, of course, um, all of our subgroups faced a myriad of errors and bugs. I think there are two main ones that um, were most prevalent. Uh, the first of the two. Uh, regarded the communication between the image processing subgroup and the autonomy logic subgroup. Um, so this video on the left that is playing currently shows our uh, our simulated autonomy logic um, going in the completely uh, going in the complete opposite direction of where it should be going. Um, so in the very beginning, our our team was not super confident with the um, angles returned by the um, angles returned by the image processing subgroup, or neither that or the um, validity of the commands based on those angles, so um, which results in situations like this. Um, then, okay. And then the second error was somewhat of a ghost error. This error took the form of a runtime warning, actually, which stemmed from um, a divide by zero in the image processing subgroup, which would happen when uh, no images were actually detected. Uh, this warning was ignored on um, some Raspberry Pis when, on which it was ran, like mine in this video right now, while it completely stopped the execution of the code on the Axel Sand Shark uh, when we try to test it out. So this ghost error, as we like to call it, um, prevented us from successfully running the code on the Axel Sand Shark for our first couple of attempts, but luckily we solved it. So yeah. Um, so th in this video, it was running successfully, then I just stopped the execution to find the error, which is going to be found right here, which I highlighted. That um, runtime warning stopped execution on the actual standard, but not on my Pi, which is super confusing and very hard to find. We were able to combine the work of all three groups to run our Sandtrack successfully on test day. The video on the left is the video of our first run. So as you can see, the AUV is detecting the first pair of buoys and turning to pass through them. And it does the same for the second pair of buoys. However, we had put a time out on our sand track that was too small and didn't give enough time to pass through the entire course. So as you can see, it just times out and floats back to the surface. We later elongated this timeout, which led to the second video, which was our second run. In this video, the AUV is also detecting the first pair of buoys and turning to pass through them. Although the AUV is detecting the second pair of buoys and turning, it is not turning enough to pass through them and narrowly misses them. It does the same for the third pair of buoys. As you can see, it, it's slightly to the right of the red buoy. Luckily, our AUV detected the fourth pair of gates and turned in time to pass through. We later realized that the AUV missed the second and third pair of buoys because we had set it to too slow of a speed. It didn't give it enough time to turn to pass through them in time. If we had the opportunity to, to work, to further work on our project, we would have the following future plans. First of all, we'd have improved image processing code. The simulation images that we trained our image detection 
algorithm with did not represent light reflection in the pool, which became a large source of error for the sand shark in practice. In the future, we plan to solve this by detecting the greatest areas of contours or the brightest contours to eliminate outliers, as well as tweaking the thresholds and box filters. And to the image to the right, you can see the, the image that data that we got that was inaccurate compared to the real thing, which was much lighter and more reflective. Second, buoy position logging. In the future, we plan to not just find the angles to the buoys, but also the positions of the buoys for better and more accurate autonomy logic and mission reconstruction. Okay, so vehicle control. Uh, we kept the same, they kept the speed from our simulation since it was easier to pinpoint errors with a slower speed. However, as you can see in the previous slide, we forgot to change it for the actual run, so it timed out. However, when we increased the speed, there was not enough time for the AV to execute the command. With further testing, we feel like we can find the optimal speed of angle, the right time of executing commands while having enough speed to be fast. So drifting. Even though the instructors jokingly challenged the class to drift through the final gate, we feel like we could have attempted this, and our idea was to count the buoys. So once we knew that we were at the last buoy, we could set the rudder, rudder to a sharp angle in the opposite direction, similar to drifting in a car. Um, and that's it. Thank you for listening and thanks to all the instructors and TAs. Any questions? Well, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we do have a couple questions. Um, one question is, how did you handle uh, integrating the components of the smaller, the subgroups you had? Uh, we were on a Zoom call and if we had like trouble, we would like just share our screen. So we knew like where every everybody in the subgroup was. So we could like match our progress. So once we finished, we would basically finish all at the same time and just yeah. our code. Most of our work we did actually at the same, like, like as Matthew said, at the same time, usually on Bobby's screen share too. So like a lot of like our stuff, like we just, or we used Discord and we ended up sending him stuff or we used GitHub, but but we found that it was most like easier to use like just screen share and just like work on it at the same time and talk it through. And uh, the next question is, how are you going to use what you've learned in this course in the future? I think the most cool part was like open CV and like isolating uh, colors. I know Bobby has like a, his own coding project that he was working on a side with um, like using it to like map out like a Rubik's cube and stuff. So I think open TV is probably the coolest part of this program. Yeah, for me, like um, I would say definitely like open CV and then like maybe some of like just the autonomy logic sort of stuff because I've worked with open MV on like a personal robot and I would definitely like to like try using a Raspberry, also using like a Raspberry Pi. Like I learned like how to use that better here. And I would definitely like to try it more for a Raspberry Pi rather than Arduino using open MV camera. Um, yeah, I agree with Matthew and Aiden. This was also the first time that I was working with Python and I really enjoyed being in which processing group and learning about OpenCV and which to implant it into future projects using like robotics club stuff. Yeah, there are just so many aspects of the project, like the image processing, the logic, the data reconstruction, the data wrangling. Like, I'm pretty sure like all of us, even if we don't like go down the robotics path in the future, we will find a way to use what we learned in the class in our future endeavors. Not to mention, we all got really good at GitHub. Though mine didn't work until the end. I know I personally learned a lot more about uh, data collection with the whole being able to read different f types of files and write data to them. So that'll be very helpful in the future for other projects I work on. Thank you for uh, your answers to that question. Okay, uh, our final and last but not least group is the bagels. Hello, we are Team Bagels, and we will present how we navigated the Autonomous Underwater Vehicle Challenge. I'm Eloise. I'm Ken Liu. I'm Jasmine. And I'm Stephen. So the, I mean, Madeline, Madeline summar summarized the challenge pretty well, but basically the challenge is to navigate an AUV through gates formed by red and green buoys. Our plan was to use the Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi camera and take pictures and use those pictures to find out 
angles to, to the green and red buoys, and then also use the, our current heading, which is the direction that the AUV is going, and the target heading calculated from the angles to the red and green buoys, and determine how much to turn the rudder to steer the AUV through the pairs of buoys. Some of our labs focused on object detection, which would be used to help steer the AUV later in the challenge. We practiced taking pictures with our Raspberry Pi camera and used a sample image of a cactus and water bottle to learn how to find the angles from the camera to the objects using the pixel positions of those objects. In addition, we learned object detection and used it in tracking the center of the turtle by isolating its color from the rest of the scene. Other labs focused on writing autonomy logic for our simulated AUV challenge. The black line shows the AUV's path and that it's passing through the red and green buoy gates. So we did image detection for the cact cactus and the water bottle and the turtle. And now we just apply that to the red, uh, green and red buoys. So on the top right, you can see the filter for the red buoy. And you could see how there is uh, a dot which shows the position of the red buoy on the image on the left. On the, uh, on the bottom right, you can see there is a dark green spot and that shows the position of the, uh, the green buoy on the filter for the image on the left. And you can see that it's identified the center of the green and red buoys on the image on the left. So use, uh, the centers of the green and red buoys to calculate the angle towards uh, the green and red buoys. And with that angle, we did two things. Uh, originally, we just calculated the difference between the average of those two angles and the current heading, and we just multiplied that by two. Uh, and then we found that that wasn't very consistent. So instead, we took the difference and we took it to a certain power and then divided it by 1.5 and it was a, it was more consistent. That's how we made decisions. On to the live on to the first day of the live testing at the MIT pool. Um, this is a video of what the sand shark is seeing using our version 0 0.2.0 code. As you can see in the video, the sand shark was not consistently in the same depth. The reason behind this is that we forgot to set the depth to one meter for the AAV and the code. After we set the depth, we ran the code again for a much more exciting result. Here's the footage of that. While the AUV went to the correct depth, it still didn't steer through the buoys and instead drove straight into the wall, cracking the dome protecting the camera. We edited the code so the AUV would stop running after 30 seconds to avoid it from crashing into the wall. We also wanted to take um, we also wanted to pass through more gates, so we increased the rate at which the AUV took pictures and tweaked the image processor using footage captured on test runs. Originally, we had tried to detect buoys based on their color and return the largest buoy found. As you can see on the top right, the AUV often thought the floor was the largest green buoy. We modified the image processor to return the largest object that was still less than a specific size. Now the AUV accurately detects the red and green buoy. Here in this video is a sand shark running our version 0 0.5.0 code on the second day of testing. <laughs> It 
passed through our gate successfully and almost a second one. Unfortunately, our AAV seems to have an infinity for smashing into walls. We were expecting to see superb photos and couldn't believe our eyes. If, you're, if you are disappointed with this green image shown before you, you will understand how we felt. It was the simulated image. We realized that in an effort to make testing more convenient, we had made a mistake. We wrote code that would tell the AUV whether to run the simulator or the camera on the Raspberry Pi, depending on the name of the computer the code was running on. However, the name of the Raspberry Pi that we tested at home was different from the name of the AUV's Pi at the pool, resulting in us running the simulator during the real challenge. Due to time constraints, we weren't able to test our version six of the code, but we do have some final takeaways. Um, we had a lot of fun and we learned a lot about autonomous vehicles. We learned how they were used in real life and the challenges that engineers face when designing these systems. If we had more time in the VWSI program, we would make the code more adaptable to different operating environments with different names and spend more time tweaking the controller code. We learned that the AUV challenge is hard, but despite the obstacles we faced, we were still able to make it through multiple sets of buoys using our non-simulator code. Finally, we want to thank um, all the, our instructors and TAs for all the help and guidance that they gave us in this process. We also want to thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, now is probably the right time to ask them. Thank you, Bagels, for your um, great presentation. Uh, the first question is, how do you choose the control parameters, such as the power and the scaling factor? We chose to run the engine at 1000 RPM because we heard that that was the stable speed um, for the AUV. Wait, did they ask how we chose the controller's parameters? I think they asked for the power and the scaling factor, but I'm not really sure what they mean by the scaling factor here. That may refer to the um, the values you had for the angles, like 1.25. Oh, we, we just experimentally determined that on the simulator. And your final question is, what was your favorite activity you worked on in this course? Um, personally, my favorite activity was when we had to take use image processing to take noise out of an image and like the static off and we it revealed um, an image underneath and that we combined the images which were of Morse code or uh, Morse code Braille and which out spelled out a, a message. Uh, my favorite part of the course uh, was working on the challenge, and I specifically worked on the image processor and making the AUV controller and backseat talk to each other. And for me, I personally enjoyed um, the part where we revealed um, images to isolate parts for the turtle from the background. Uh, it looks like we have one more question. How do you achieve uh, neutral buoyancy for the AUV? I think we set the depth to one meter for the AUV, so it just automatically um, stays at that depth. We didn't program the front seat that like controls the buoyancy really. Yeah, I would jump in there. So the instructors had to balance the vehicle so it's pretty close to neutral. And then in the students program the um, speed and depth to and the vehicle was responsible for maintaining maintaining that depth. But it had to be pre balanced for them since we were remote this year. Next year they will do it themselves. Uh, thank you to all of the groups who have presented today uh, for speaking about your various uh, adventures with the AUVs. And um, thank you to everybody attending this class's um, final. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much to all the students for participating in the inaugural expedition.
<laughs> and being so patient with all of the challenges we faced throughout the course. Joe, did you want to have any final words? Oh, there we go. So my mouse was stuck for some reason. I couldn't actually reach the mute button, unmute button. So I just wanted to say, so since we're here, we have the audience also here that you know, this course would not have happened without Madeline pushing uh, from October through now. So I hope everybody appreciates uh, all the hard work that, that she put into making this course possible. And you students made the course worth all the hard work that we put in. So thank you for coming.